trickle in. I have the roster up if we want to quick do uh, introductions. I think everybody's still getting to kind of know each other quick. Kathy, are you on? I am. Hi, everyone. I'm Kathy Fraser. I am um, representing the city of Brooklyn Park. Corey. Hi, I'm Corey Funk, and I am also in Brooklyn Park, and I'm a Sammy Perella's fan. Ooh. <laughs> That's a good one. Caroline, I don't know if I saw her on. Craig, I almost I almost skipped, skipped it. <laughs> hey, everyone. Craig Gottschalk, and I'm representing Crystal. Good evening. Our Robbinsdale folks. Hi, I'm Jason, and Jean is there as well. <laughs> Golden Valley. Hi, all. Scott Boer. Hey, all. Felipe. Our city of Minneapolis folks, starting with Kathy. I don't know if I see Kathy on yet. Uh, Peggy, is Peggy Sue on? Yes, she is. Maybe not fully connected yet. Welcome, uh, Peggy Sue. Good evening. Even if you're having trouble unmuting, Giuseppe. Giuseppe from Minneapolis, and my favorite pizza is over in St. Paul. Carboni's on Randolph is as close as you get to Chicago style pizza. Being from Chicago, I can say that. <laughs> You're here for Chicago style. It is probably my favorite as well. Is Catherine on yet? Didn't see her name. Hey, okay. uh, Ken? Yeah, Ken Rogers. I represent the uh, Metropolitan Council Transportation Access Advisory Committee. And our folks that were appointed by Hennepin County, but actually live in many, well, everybody li lives in Hennepin County, uh, but uh, that's on this call, but uh, the also live in various cities along our project corridor. So starting with Adam. Hey, Adam, North Minneapolis resident. And I think we're forgetting about Fat Lorenzo's over Southside. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's an iconic, iconic. That's a have to. <laughs> Uh, is John, I don't know if I saw John. Is John on? And no worries, Peggy. So sometimes it's getting our technology all figured out. I saw Ellis. Hey, everybody. Ellis. Uh, Adam. And the folks that were appointed by Metropolitan Council, but also live in the various cities along the line. Let's see, who is on? Is Nira? Oh, Brett. Uh, hi, Brett Buckner um, from Met Council, but um, North Minneapolis and go Polars and go Broadway Pizza. <laughs> and Jennifer. Okay, Chair, that's uh, introductions. We have staff on the line as well, but I, um, we can kind of uh, get to know us as we go through the presentation and kind of back to you to uh, get, take on the next agenda item. Yeah, so um, I guess we need to, hopefully everybody was able to look at the minutes from uh, March 1st and the March 22nd meeting. So I guess we need to um, approve those notes the minutes so moved do we have a second prove the minutes as second written so uh that i guess <laughs> i don't do we have like a photo official motions i don't know like how hard how how you know to follow we, uh, for the minutes, the committee seems to just like to take the formal motion, so we don't really okay. vote, but it works just to do it that way. Okay, cool. 
So, um, yeah, so I think as far as motions go, that's approved <laughs> in the minutes from our last meetings. Um, so then I guess we need to, um, to get into talking about the, um, the follow-up from the March 22nd meeting. And I think there is some, there are presentation, am I doing the presentation or is that? So I can get that loaded. And uh, yeah. in terms of that agenda topic, um, I, we just, oh, hang on, we go to full screen. Talking and doing at the same time is harder than it seems sometimes. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of what I have up for this slide, you know, the, uh, just kind of think the request uh, to have some time for folks to share any other thoughts or ask any questions from our last meeting and the route rollout. Um, and uh, Jason, I think you know when we t when we talked as a, a, a group, uh, as a with the co-chairs, just yeah. wanting to folks to think if there's any kind of engagement that they would like to see happen and whatnot. This could be a space for that to, yeah. to, to sure, yeah, yep, and and that makes sense. So I think you know one of the things that has come up repeatedly in our meetings is just that like things get presented during this meeting and then it's like we're asking for immediate feedback and it's like well we want to engage with the community and and actually have something to talk about that goes beyond our own opinions uh, and so i think i wanted to make sure we or, or felipe and i just want to make sure we had this time to um you know if there were things and there will be i don't know if you were able to look at the agenda but there are some things that we're going to get into as far as detail so if there's if it if it isn't something that needs to come up now, we'll probably talk about it later, but just to make sure that there was a space built into the meeting um, for the different organizations and stakeholders and um, CAC members to give feedback based on, I guess the last meeting, it was like, here is, <laughs> here's what we want your opinions on. And it was like, give it to us right now. And we don't really have all that information yet. So I guess leave us. So one of the, it's Felipe. So one of the things that I was thinking about from our last call, and I saw it in the chat box um, on the last call, was one of the questions that you know we're we're talking about the three options that you had, area one, two, and three, um, and it just led me to a couple questions. One is we we're talking about one train line. Do we have an overall picture of what the entire train line should look like in twenty, thirty, fifty years? Are we trying to map? every city town suburb to get an opportunity to connect to each suburb or to get downtown it seems a little hard just saying we've got one run route that we're going to do and it's going to go from downtown to brooklyn park well are we going to go east or west or any of that so i i think when we talk about sharing out with the communities if there's any ideas of a bigger map of here's where we're planning to sort of go or think we're going to go in the next 20 30 years i think that would be helpful um, just yeah. to ease a lot of a lot of you know questions because you know you're saying here's the three areas that you have to choose for the three routes and then there's a lot of questions like well how do you only get to those three routes can we not have those three and two or there more are we looking at just that you know so i would think any talking points around that would be helpful for when we sure. go out to talk um, to the community uh we can bring maybe to the next meeting uh, Metro mm -hmm. Transit's or the council really the kind of long range planning map uh, yeah. in terms of our metro system. Now that doesn't we have our whole bus system and and that as well. And but the metro includes LRT and, and bus rapid transit, kind of those mm -hmm. beefier metro systems. And so we can bring that um, visual for folks and kind of talk about how things get added um, to that. So Liz, help me remember that in the notes as a follow up for for next week. And I'm sure the chairs will. So please place you on our chair. We'll uh, make sure that gets on the agenda. <laughs> yeah. Um, good. Any other thoughts? Um, and uh, chair chairs, I also, you know, I have a little bit of kind of what we've been hearing so far, engagement reports. So it might uh, spur some additional conversation if um, if we just want to get into it. Yeah. It doesn't. I'm not seeing any raised hands and no one's unmuting. So I think we'll, let's move forward because I mean, it will, part of the agenda addresses some of the feedback that we're, we've been hearing. And I think maybe some individual um, city representatives can speak to it as well. Sounds great. Okay. I'll jump in then. Oops. Ah! Okay. Um, 
funky mouse. Okay, there, in the space that it needs to be. So, you know, we're in the process now of getting ongoing feedback and just kind of want to highlight what we're hearing so far and talk about how in the next month or even more, we, you know, continue to uh, get robust feedback and get people both aware of the project as well as start that kind of response of, of filling in those details that people are really asking about. So obviously we've been talking to all of you, right? So a lot of feedback comes from the advisory committees. I think we've tried to adjust and be mobile based on what we've what we've heard from our advisory committees. We had the three town halls with about 150 participants between the, the three events. Some of you attended those. It's uh, always interesting to hear your feedback on how you, what you thought of them, but some very, I think, robust discussion in all of those, a lot of takeaways. Uh, we were starting to have more community and business stakeholder check-ins, so kind of more on that, like, either focused geographic uh, or smaller group. Uh, and uh, folks on this call have even helped me kind of get connected to those opportunities, and, and we really appreciate that. So uh, that is a lot of our focus right now. Um, we have the interactive map. My next slide kind of shows a picture of that, but we've had over 200 comments, and that's some people are commenting. Some of those comments are folks commenting multiple times. Maybe like put a couple station locations, and then the response. There's responses to some of the comments as well. Our survey. I put the finished the slide deck about Thursday, and at that time we had about 700 responses. In the last few days since then, we're getting closer to we're we're over 800 now. So that number has changed, but and that, that also just kind of caveats sh shows shows the feedback that's kind of coming in and how it's evolving. I uh, just want to note that though for the next slide as I pulled some statistics from the survey. We have a general comment form and just comments into me. I'd say we have about a few dozen like official comments and then a lot of things that are just coming in as uh, like statements or more sorry questions or just wanting discussion about what people are seeing. So kind of more of that conversational versus like I have an official comment for the record. So been a lot of this uh, in terms of just people wanting to engage, get more information, have a conversation. So the our if you're on our homepage of our website, the interactive map, everybody can see the comments. So if you want to poke around in any of the areas and see what your fellow neighbors are saying, um, yeah, that this is the place to go uh, and, and continue to add to it. You know, I think it's, it's interesting how a, a dot will actually spur a conversation among people and people kind of answer each other almost in it or add to it. So please take a look, please add. It's, a, it's been very, uh, I know our engineering team pokes it around a, a, a lot as well. And from all of these platforms that we're talking about, so talking to you all, having these broader meetings, starting to have more specific meetings, uh, the survey itself, we're starting to see some themes emerge. And so I just wanna to touch on those real quick. So overall, I think we've heard a fair, fairly general support of LRT, folks wanting to do the transit investments, but a lot of the support is also coupled with their wanting more information. And I've had a lot of conversations where people are like, I wanna fight for LRT, but you need to answer these things for me first before I'm before I feel comfortable saying yes to this idea to your route that you're proposing. So uh, obviously a directive for us to work through throughout the year and, and drill down in. Um, but that's I think a good uh, that's a good place to be. And then as you kind of uh, peel back that next layer, you know, a lot of specific questions about well, what does this roadway look like? Are you keeping the left turn, you know, kind of, kind of to that granular climate, but even just What's, what's the impact to my adjacent home, my business, this, the overall look and feel of the roadway with this infrastructure? And obviously the desire to uh, preserve business. So you're hearing a lot about you know, various um, community assets and gems uh, in the, in the, along our alignment where people are very uh, wanting to just say like, don't mess up with this place, right? Uh, make it, have, have that light touch. And then there's been basically three major things that have kind of, that we keep hearing about the most. And uh, I'm gonna kind of actually go backwards up the list of so stations. You know, for the uh, sections of the line that are new, that is the main question. And actually the main, uh, one of the main things that people have kind of reached out to me and wanted to talk through, like, uh, how are you placing stations? Could a station be here? I have a business here. 
you know, we would like to see a station. We deal with a lot of youth, you know, that, that kind of thing. And really the over overarching thing is obviously you can't pick a line if you don't know where the stations are. Like you can't you can't feel comfortable with what we're coming forward until until we have that discussion. Kind of coupled with what I was talking before, structures, right? Could this be elevated? Could this be in a tunnel? Uh, how do you get that process of adding that? That's that's been something that um, overall uh, been we hear it in all of our venues. And I think that gets into starting to show some of that initial engineer, engineering work and the need for that. And then that uh, kind of green infrastructure. And I, I kind of took two pathways of comments to kind of put into that piece, which is we're hearing a lot of folks that just want to see us push the limits of what the LRT system looks like. So in terms of planting, uh, other green infrastructure, but even more in like the, the, the pure infrastructure itself. So thinking of our water management and being very conscious of that or uh, you know, we're ripping up a road. Can we be more envi environmentally friendly with how we do water management? Or uh, just really thinking about having a walkable space, a walkable, bikeable space. Um, so I think, you know, climate change is maybe more on people's minds than it was 10 years ago. And so hearing a lot of push push for us to, to push the needle where we can. Or even just how LRT supports, uh, supports those goals. So, want to caveat these numbers very strongly in the sense that oh sorry go ahead jason one other question uh and i know it comes up maybe it's specifically in robinsdale it could be in other areas as well but just around like pedestrian safety and like safety as far as like roads and turn i guess that maybe falls into turn lanes and stuff a little bit but just around like overall kids on bikes, people walking across the street, just like line safety, I know is a theme that I've run into a lot. I don't know if that's consistent across the board, but that I just wanted to throw that out there. Thanks for that. And um, uh, I should, I would say pedestrian safety um, and, and more, so, more so in terms of their interaction with cars. Um, you know, people will ask about lighting or things like that, but it's really, uh, is this a friendly walkable environment? Uh, has come up, I think, almost almost across the board as well. So, yeah, yeah, Sophia, when we get into street running, when we get into talking about street running LRT, just the intersect the interaction between vehicular traffic, pedestrian traffic, LRT traffic, um, bicycles, and just all of those ways will become important. What are the cues? What are the design elements that we can use to help people realize, okay, this is safe. This is not safe. Don't be here. Don't be there. And, you know, we've learned a lot about the, the, the pluses and minuses and how to build that in. That'll be a big piece along the entire alignment in all the cities. Yes. Uh, I just also have to say, I love how Jason got my attention. So that works really well for anybody uh, during the conversation. It's, it's a lot easier to see. Was that Ken? Sorry, Ken. Oh yeah, no, no worries. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to add a comment. I, I feel a little bit of deja vu um, to to some degree because I served on the LRT Central Corridor mm -hmm. uh, University uh, CAC, and you know, and I know many of these details that people want to drill down to right away. The questions about uh, water flow and being being more green, uh, lighting. Uh, pedestrian flow, all of those things are coming just based on my past experience working on the green line. Um, once the alignment gets created and set um, and the station designs are all considered, then all that other stuff kind of falls in place. So um, I, I think it's interesting to hear people's comments about those types of things because those are important to people. Um, but in the life cycle, if I can compare it to the uh, the um, the central corridor, it, its time will come. Um, the one thing I do want to comment in, and I was going to bring this up later, but I might as well bring it up now. Um, the one thing I think we might have a missed opportunity if we're not able to do the same thing with the blue line extension is I think the one thing that saved the central corridor was you know, it was clear from the beginning that 
from building line on one side of the street to the building line on the other side of the street was completely going to be redone. And that gave business owners and people with businesses on the line um, a little bit of a pause because they know that not only was the line construction going to be a disruption to their business, but if we were also constructing sidewalks and all that stuff, that's also going to create uh, an interruption to their business. And in on the corridor, there was a group of staff that had access to a bucket of funds that were there. I think they were called mitigation funds and they could interact with business owners and talk about different things that they could do to help mitigate interruptions to their business for many on the green line on university because they had the ability and and uh, back parking lots they some people chose to put entrances in the back and that was kind of picked up or costs for that were shared with with uh, uh, the green line uh, central corridor um, that really turned a lot of business naysayers into business supporters. And as I understand it, we're not approaching the same, um, the same approach uh, on, on this line. Can somebody identify that a little more clearly for me? Sure, sure Ken, I've obviously, thanks for that. And I, and I know that well. Um, and I would say that, that that is, I would not say that we have certainly gotten anywhere close to a, the ability to recognize that yet. And I would imagine something very similar would be part of the project. What Ken refers to is we built an allowance into the construction contract um, on Central Corridor that we were able to tap into where say, and this was especially prevalent on University Avenue, may not be everywhere here, but let's yeah. say we needed to work at a driveway um in front of a business and that driveway had to be closed for a few days we were able to say open up the fence in the back parking lot provide access from the alley and then put some signs up into that in guiding people into that property um via the alley um and then and then when we were done with the driveway kind of replace the fence again and put it back in order so i think ken that same kind of thing will likely be um will likely be available um and of course it's different in different parts of the quarter in some spots we will absolutely likely be reconstructing from building to building across the right of way in robbinsdale and in in uh minneapolis especially when we're in crystal right we may not be we may be building lrt in the roadway but not ne needing to reconstruct the whole roadway so it'll be different along different parts of the quarter but yeah, that'll that'll be part of what we'll build in to help get people around and in and to serve those businesses during construction. Okay. Thank you. Anything um, else before I move on? Sometimes discussion leads to discussion. Okay. Uh, again, welcome invitation to jump in and whenever you want with questions. That's, uh, again, don't want to just present, right? It's good to actually hear from folks. So caveat numbers, these will change. With getting about 800 comments, you know, we want, we still want about triple that, right? In terms of hearing from folks and reaching deeper. So this is really kind of just a first blush, just so folks kind of see what we're seeing so far. And so about 55% of folks when asked what route uh, are you most in favor of advancing, selected West Broadway. About 22% prefer Lowry Avenue and about 23% basically need more information or have an, another reason uh, for, for or another option. So that could include uh, saying something like no LRT um, or uh, is suggesting something. So a lot, a lot of this number though, is that there was a pretty good amount of folks that just want more information before they select a preference. We talked briefly as a committee about the project goals, and that is a topic that'll have to come back at a future meeting, especially as we start to uh, fill in the criteria uh, and then kind of get to that matrix for evaluation um, of, of the system. But so far, 60% of folks are saying that the, the two the, the two items that come to the top are 
really that improved transit access and that connection to jobs and regional destinations. So kind of a, a, one of the top priorities that we could, should consider when evaluating options. The other one is to advance local and regional equity and work towards reducing racial disparities, re regional racial disparities. Uh, and just for a, a reminder, this was not originally one that was part of the Blue Line 1.0. Uh, and we pulled that specifically out of the criteria um, in, into the project goals based on conversations. It was kind of embedded in it, but not as uh, in the forefront. And so that was part of the update. And I think something that we heard from the committee also that was something of, uh, to support. So that's some very preliminary stuff of what we're hearing. This is kind of focused on uh, area three to some extent with West Broadway. Um, any questions? Otherwise, I'll turn it over to Joan to talk a little bit about the community engagement cohort. Jean. Um, on the advanced local and regional equity and work towards reducing regional racial disparities, you know, this 55% going down West Broadway, um, generally thinking, if that occurs and West Broadway becomes vibrant, doesn't that take care of uh, the uh, reducing regional racial disparities? That's just a question. Yeah, so I think the, the way to frame that is as you look at the options, which one uh, is able to most uh, do do that? So that, that is kind of the root of the question, yeah. Okay, uh, feel free to jump in with more thoughts, but uh, turn it over to Joan Van Hala for a second to get us grounded in the work of the community engagement cohort contractors. Hi all, this is Joan Van Hala. I'm Hennepin County Engagement Specialist and part of the Blue Line LRT Project Management Team. And we have finalized 14 community engagement contracts um, recognizing that we have community experts on cultures and geographies in the corridor that we can tap into as they reach out to their natural networks. We have community and cultural groups that focus on area one, area two, and area three. So we feel like we have very good coverage throughout the corridor. We have uh, included in those 14, we have four groups that are focusing on um, amplifying project community networks. And I encourage you guys to do that too. We're all connected to a circle of people and that will really help to get the word out on the survey and, and the mapping tool that um, is on the project webpage. The goal of this group we've had we're going on to their third meeting. We had two orientation sessions, and now we're gonna be meeting monthly. And the whole goal of this group is to be collaborative and coordinated across the corridor with the project management team. And um, also maybe at some point, if you were interested, we could have them meet the community advisory committee. These are 10 month contracts and they end on January, 2022. So if you could go to the next slide, Sophia. So here's the list of groups that we are bringing on board. Um, I think you can see that we have some really great cultural representation in this list. Um, these groups are connected to the African-American community, African immigrant community, Asian Pacific Islanders, the Latino community, small businesses, youth and young adults, neighborhood organizations, and the arts community. And they will be applying some strategies and tactics for engaging their networks um, by amplifying project messaging. They'll be doing virtual listening sessions, hopefully in the summer, keeping our fingers crossed, we'll be able to do COVID safe in-person community events, talking about focus groups, one-on-ones with key stakeholders, creative engagement through the art 
through arts and also um, in-person surveys recognizing not everybody feels comfortable going online and filling out a survey. So that's pretty much um, the work that we're doing. They're already beginning to schedule some, quite a few activities coming up. So, and that's it for me. Joan, I have a question. Sure. So I, I see a lot of cultures represented on these uh, on these teams. Are there any uh, or what's the plan to try to uh, encompass people with disabilities across all of the right. all of the areas? But I don't see specifically disabilities. So right, what's the plan? and that's that's a really good point, Ken. And I think I and I remember you bringing that up before. I think um, I could talk it over with Sophia. I'd be perfectly willing to have you come and talk to the group. I'm I'm sure that within the geographic serving neighborhoods and even within those different cultural communities, there's people who are connected to people living with disabilities. Um, but I think it's important to be intentional about the approach. And so if possible, I'd like to ta tap your expertise on how to ensure that we um, have some intention around reaching out to the disability community. And, uh, and, maybe, I, and maybe to add on to that too, um, kind of we, in kind of the phase that we're in too, we really want to identify the kind of um, targets and gaps that we have we kind of have the group that apply, ended up applying to be part of the cohort and uh, Joan took some efforts even to reach out further and try to fill in a little bit and it was kind of uh, how things ended up being contracted. Um, but that doesn't mean that we aren't also focused on reaching uh, the demographics of people. And some of those groups you know, work with uh, elders that might have mobility challenges, but that doesn't necessarily capture the array uh, of folks. So um, to that point, you know, uh, we, we as staff can work on connecting with different communities uh, in that and really want to focus on, and that is a demographic that we want to make sure also gets specific um, uh, engagement. And it, like Joan says, um, tapping your expertise is obviously hugely valuable. Right, and if I'm not mistaken, um, when we talked about the Blue Line Extension way back when, um, there was a station being planned kind of near uh, the Courage Center. Yep. That might be a, a good place to kind of focus on. Yes, there. I was. Uh, we've really appreciated the the Courage County Center as a partner, and you know, in kind of one of our next topics too, it's kind of some of these. Um, project benefits that now are different, right? Because we had a station that was very, very close to them and now that's not necessarily the case. And so Metro Transit still has the obligation to follow through and think about um, the transit access uh, to that to that location. Um, and so that's, an, that's another example of a piece that even with the pivot, we don't want to lose. Uh, but Ken, I think the biggest message is we are committed to, the, to that work and making sure that we are that we are uh, inclusive. Right, so it's important to note that with the community engagement cohort there, you know, we also have our own staff that are gonna be doing additional community engagement. Those aren't the folks that are only gonna be doing the community engagement. Okay, gotcha. I'm also kind of curious, um, Joan, just from a like a geographical outlook or you know the areas that they're focused on the three two and one it looks like it's very concentrated in three and i'm wondering if it's similar in the fact that that's where th those groups are located but that their attention can go beyond that it just doesn't look like there's very much for area one and two as far as community outreach and if that's right sophia can you go back to that previous slide for a minute Partly that was intentional, Jason, knowing that area one is where there's likely not going to be any change in the planned route. And the most important part of up in area one is make sure the people are informed and updated on the current status of the project. Area two is, um, you know, Medium. six, 
yeah, has some change, most of the change being focused in Robbinsdale. And then area three is really the area of the most change. So we'll require the most community engagement and more intensive community engagement. So um, <laughs> that's how that's how we intentionally set up this community engagement cohort. And, and I can definitely appreciate that. I mean, it is like a large change. There's more options in area three, but I would say as far as the way that it's impacting the community and where it's being placed in, in the community, area two, even though it's only moving a little bit like distance wise, it's a pretty significant change um, mm -hmm. as far as like how it impacts our community. So I guess, mm -hmm. I, you know, just, Obviously, we're here to help get the word out and get feedback and, and have those conversations. But I think it is worth noting that even though it looks relatively similar and there are sections in Crystal and Robbinsdale where it's relatively close to the original alignment, mm -hmm. when it comes out of the rail corridor, it makes a major difference in the community. So just want to point that out. Absolutely. And I acknowledge that. And I think I'll refer back to Sophia about how the project is really focusing on making sure those cities and those communities are fully engaged in, in the new direction that the Blue Line LRT is taking. Yeah, Joan, I think that last part of that sentence is, is basically the crux of it. Um, you know, Got a lot of got a lot of folks on board to help us extend our work, um, it, but it you know every, everybody has their kind of um, niches and and things. We still have dedicated project staff um, that are committed to working you know w with the Robbinsdale business community with uh, you know or or on other places. So the project team is still here. Um, you know this this. I think we have a really, really awesome group of folks. It's it, I, Metro Transit usually doesn't have the flexible dollars to do something like this. So working so closely with Hennepin County to even take this step um, is something that I find super awesome. Uh, this isn't the end all be all. And so um, just need to still have, I think the, I'm starting to ramble a little bit, but the crux of it is that we are committed to engagement throughout the project area. And uh, this group will do awesome work and the project team will fill in and work with our trusted contacts uh, to make sure that we're reaching everybody that we need to reach. I don't know, Jason, if that answered your question. Yeah, no, that helps. And maybe, I mean, I'm looking at like West Broadway, which obviously comes into Robbinsdale. Um, like the Cleveland neighborhood is directly across the parkway from Robbinsdale. And so maybe it's, you know, these areas are where they're geographically located, but their focus can, can come over into some of these other areas in addition to maybe having some other uh, groups that are focused in Robbinsdale mm -hmm. and Crystal. And to not, not all of these contracts are uh, equal dollar value. Um, so the ones on the bottom um, just have kind of smaller communication grants. So they are just kind of um, amplifying project messaging uh, kind of thing. So we have kind of um, the resources of folks to, to, varying, to varying levels as well. And if I could maybe, um, Chairs and Sophia, this is Sam O'Connell, just also offer up, and I think, Joan, maybe you want to share a little bit about this too, is that there's also the hope that they're working with each other and learning from each other. So it's the reason why they are called a cohort. Um, so some of these groups will be teaming up and and doubling, if you will, their their efforts. Um, so that's also pretty exciting. So I don't know, Joan, if you wanted to share a little bit more behind that thinking. Sure. Um, definitely, we're encouraging collaborations because the contracts that we have with these guys aren't a heck of a lot of money. But they are nonprofits with that are mission driven, and they're very dedicated to ensuring that communities are involved in this major project. I think if you look on under the areas column, you'll see that Asian Media Access is working in area two um, with the focus on the Asian community. Uh, Liberian Business Association is connected in area two 
with immigrant businesses and actually all small businesses they provide technical resource for. Northside Economic Opportunity Network is in area two and they've done some work directly with Robbinsdale Chamber of Commerce. But I think it's also really good to note that Sam and Sophia are interested to hear from folks in Robbinsdale and Crystal if there are any community groups that we should be reaching out to, churches that we should be reaching out to for presentations and information sharing. I also know that I've, I've done work, I did work with the Botano Community Works Project, and I know that Marsha is an awesome person to talk to about reaching out to her community and making sure that people are informed. So um, we're completely committed to ensuring that Robbinsdale Crystal and 63rd and Brooklyn Park are well served with our community engagement. Thank it's you. It's also why this committee is set up the way it is, right? It, it has uh, everybody because we will have very area specific conversations, but we also need to have this project holistic conversation. And um, as we see by themes, things that come up in one area also get uh, translated into to other spaces as well. So um, Jason, I, I, I've, we have a lot more work to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate the feedback. That's helpful. Okay. So we kind of already talked about this slide, but a little bit of uh, in the month of April, what we're really aiming to do is to host and participate in at targeted at, at events at either specific groups or areas of the corridor. And that is, you know, kind of every, to Jason's point, uh, every area, the cohort um, is help, um, helps with this. Some of, some of you are helping with this. And so those that have uh, reached out to me uh, for events, like I, I, we really appreciate it. Just, just want to put that out there, and it, it, we're gonna fill in those gaps. That, that is what we got to do right now. So, uh, I, unless there are other questions, we can move on to the next section, and I'll kind of turn it to Dan and Sam to give us some initial thoughts and grounding on this, and we'll just, we'll just, uh, yeah, it'll. Okay. There you go. All right, Sophia, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. You can take a break. You've been doing a lot of talking and facilitating some very good conversation today, and and thank you. And um, as Sophia said, just you know, just to um, that last slide, we'll be able to come back in and um, next month and share with you where those gaps are, where we're backfilling in, and kind of the the more of a plan of what we're doing. So um, we here, we we uh, we want to do this right. And we absolutely know we need to be connecting. So part of it is just getting that engine to run a little bit and make sure we're making those connections. So um, we want to spend some time with you all tonight to talk a little bit about um, kind of some of the issues that we've been hearing. Um, and it's just not the issues in the last couple of weeks with the release of the potential routes that we're looking for feedback on. It's actually kind of going back to some of the um, concerns that communities have raised since we um, decided to transition the project since August of 2020. So we just want to touch on a, on a couple things. So as we have are working through this, our mind kind of sees these things. These are connected things. These are not discrete things. But just to kind of help us organize a little bit about what we are engaging on and what we're accomplishing through this project, is um, we spent uh, our last meeting in kind of these last few weeks in that conceptual engineering and design box, right? So that's where you got to hear from Dan and Nick and the team and talking a little bit about what are some of these lines? What could they look like? And kind of why were they, um, um, you know, identified as hosting uh, light rail service through communities and, um, you know, kind of understanding a little bit of, of what that means. So we spent some time in there. We will revisit that. We will definitely come back to that. Um, you hear from Sophia and Joan as we also want to talk with community members about the project goals and the objectives and the criteria. We know this is very important and um, our communities, our advisory committees, our quarter management committee in particular has really helped us frame some of that and we want to come back, right? We are hearing what's important. Sophia talked a little bit about, you know, green infrastructure and um, we want to maximize the opportunities a project like this can bring and absolutely minimize 
the negative impacts and begin to really get in front of that early on. So we'll continue to engage on that. So what we want to share with you and begin to roll out and just begin to explore the space, can't say we have all the answers, can't say we even are speaking the common language right now, but we want to just kind of begin to work on the community benefits and the previous project commitment. So we can just go to that next slide uh, that talks about that. So what do we say about community benefits and kind of previous um, commitments? So I'll stay on that left side of the slide in terms of community benefits. And it really is what we've been hearing since August when we've transitioned, when the project is sort of moving into this new area is for some of our community members, it's really hard to be thinking about the benefits of this project until we can really begin to understand anti-displacement and equitable development and how could a project like this begin to build community wealth through, you know, through multiple generations. So we're going to spend some time with that tonight um, in that area. And we also kind of see that the commitments and some of the comments that we heard today, it's like, well, what happens to the former project? Sophia, I think, referred to it as kind of like, you know, Blue Line 1.0 um, that we were working on for so long, really engaged with community members. They brought their best selves and really shared with us their desires to make their community safer by using light rail, by bringing additional investments, by using light rail to connect you know, portions of the community. Well, with the alignment moving somewhere else, what happens to that and where do we go with that? So that's also um, a little bit of uh, talking about our kind of next focus. I'm gonna hold there and see if Dan wants to add anything to what, we, what we're what we sharing with you tonight. Well, I just, I just wanna add that, you know, what you will realize, most of you that, are, that will spend some time with us on this LRT project over the next few years, is that the topics and the pieces that we work on just bounce around um, a lot. And there are so many things. So we will spend many days as you will as you will see in the future talking about you know should the station go here should a station go there what are the benefits of of designing around various areas um how should we treat pedestrian crossings um what how should we treat business impacts all of those direct you know where the tracks go and how the train operates kind of things and then it's also important for us that we spend time and focus on other less direct and maybe more indirect um, areas like we're gonna talk about tonight and what effects there can be to community and to businesses and um, housing and um, and just livability and, and uh, those kind of things around the communities where light rail gets built. And so we're gonna spend a little time there today talking about some of our ideas and some of how um, we want um, the CAC as well as our other um, committees to help guide us on this. Um, Sam also brought up the fact, and, and this came up from Ken earlier about Courage Kenny, and you're right, I'm glad that Rob Golden Valley is still with us on this committee. Um, some of the work we did, we worked a lot on other areas when we when we move this forward. And so we have to be sure we can't forget about the fact that just because there may not be a station within um, um, a very close vicinity to Courage County, it's still very close to the alignment. So how do we still connect with them? How do we still address the improvements that were going to be part of the previous alignment that may be different now? And then as as Jason said earlier, how do we deal with the fact that, you know, we were going to be on the railroad and now we're going to be maybe even close by, but with much different impacts. So how does that all roll up um, together? So all part of what we'll do, we, we're, we'll look forward to um, engaging a little bit tonight and then working on the development of this um, kind of anti-displacement work will be probably pieces of our agendas wouldn't you think, Sam, going forward? Um, we're not gonna answer all the questions tonight. We're not gonna, this is not meant to be the, here's what we're gonna do. This is meant to be the introduction of the concept and some discussion. And then this will be pieces of our agenda going forward so we can continue to work on it. 
Thanks, Dan. And, and, and I would just, uh, sorry, Sophia, if I could just add to that, um, you know, so this is where we heard you where you said, boy, it's really hard for us to react to something. And and what we want to do is roll this out, like Dan was saying, kind of roll this out, see if we're, if we're hitting that on, on kind of targeting in and kind of zoning in and, and into uh, kind of what the issues are, um, potentially a pathway to help us really get around that as well. Um, so uh, again, we don't expect you all to have the answers either tonight, but if you do have a gut reaction, if you do have something you're like, this is exactly what I was thinking about, or I was kind of thinking about this, but I also see it from this angle, let's have that, let's, you know, we have time for that discussion. So Sophia is gonna kick us off and then Dan and I are gonna kind of jump in a little bit as we walk through this. So if it's okay, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bring this back to Sophia. So it's a little uh, co-presenting here tonight. And I'll also add, uh, you know, as we've been rolling this out and I've had conversations through the day and I just want to offer kind of two other pieces of framing uh, in that and that the last few meetings that we've had, we've been doing a lot of very foundational work, right? The information is uh, new. We need to build upon it as we go. Um, so we're, we're just still in that phase, right? It's, it's kind of getting, getting the base of our work rolling and established and whatnot. Um, also just, and I'll just kind of get this into the next slide because it's related about what we've heard. Uh, kind of getting to the root of the issue and, and why the, the why we're bringing the anti-displacement topic to the forefront and really want to just kind of uh, get in the community committees uh, thinking that, you know, for some folks, and the issue of addressing displacement during this project is issue number one. And so that might not be the case for everybody on this call today, uh, but it is something that the project team uh, has been hearing a lot of and wants to take very proactive measures on. Um, kind of to this first bullet is displacement and gentrification ha it has been expressed to us as a major concern for the community. Um, you know, to that extent of, you know, folks don't want to design their own displacement, right? Like, and we're not just talking about, you know, direct impacts by the project, like, oh, we have to take this one building because, you know, the, uh, the tracks, you know, do something. We're talking about kind of even the, the forces of investment, right? Like fully figuring out how you maximize the investment that's coming to do good versus um, just create displacement knowing that development and redevelopment really emanating from the community and responding to the community vision. Uh, we talked a lot already tonight uh, about how the previous alignment brought investments and those needs remain. They don't go away because we, we pivot. And uh, you know, today I've been in a couple conversations, um, both uh, in a big group and then a phone call um, from folks that are were, were kind of um, uh, distraught, you know, about us uh, pivoting the project and losing those losing those benefits. I talked to a homeowner um, that was, you know, was expecting uh, LRT, right? So we we don't want to lose that, um, and we want community at the table, just like you all are with us tonight, uh, and extending more. And community wants community at the table, right? Like, uh, and part of that is as project sponsors. So as we bring this light rail. We, we have an obligation to address these issues and develop strategies and policies in conjunction with the project that speak to these issues, right? Sometimes it's kind of like dealt with over there, right? And uh, we're, not, we're not in that world anymore, right? It has to be fundamental to, to what, we're, what we're doing. We heard also kind of of that, that beginning of, so what, you know, what if, right? What, and, really recognizing that and, celebra and celebrating that we have very dynamic and vibrant community assets, both in terms of businesses and cultural spaces on our alignment that we want to celebrate and amplify and strengthen and not lose. Uh, there's a, with, with a major investment, just the, ex the expansion of community wealth that lasts and the people that are living in communities now get to benefit and enjoy that and we don't just want to admire the problem, right? With some of these kind of uh, hard to put your finger on issues that you can kind of chunk out pieces, but you really need to get to a slate of policies and strategies that are supported by resources that you could implement. So uh, no just admiring the problem, really uh, actionable items throughout. And that could be something that is 
we need right now in terms of baselining data so that we can measure and track or uh, kind of to very specific places in the project. We as a project team, uh, and, and this is both uh, what we've heard and what we reflect upon, is that we know we need to pull, pull in more people than uh, just kind of focus on the blue line right now. And, and some of that is the folks on this call today, right? Is that the, uh, the public and private uh, entities, philanthropic institutions that do this work and further these efforts. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sam a little bit to talk about our, our, our kind of reflection process to get to this topic. Thanks, Sophia. Um, and we will have some uh, we do have some spaces in here where we've we've intended for us to have discussion. So just bear with us for a couple more slides and, and we'll get through that. So um, when we're sharing here about project partner reflection, this comes from not only the, the Met Council, but this is also Hennepin County. And we had to get real with ourselves and just sort of take this all in and say, boy, you know, two weeks ago, we just dropped potential route options that were asking. So let's start working into the space really fast. And we really, we, we, all of a sudden we started hearing ourselves and we said, that sounds a little crazy right now. So let's, let's see what we bring to the table. What is it that we bring some positive and some negative energy and let's kind of figure that out. So it's our opportunity and we don't do this very often in government, in the agencies we work in to just take a pause and take a breath. So I just want to share with you that we recognize that we need to address the community concerns at all levels and across all sectors. And I think that provides us some incredible opportunities. It's also the challenge of this as well. It's bringing everybody to the table. It's beginning to really see this and from such different angles. And it's, and it's not easy. We recognize that. But that is, that is something that we recognize we need to be doing. We also recognize our, our mere presence can raise concerns over trust, the sustainability of the effort, and really raises past trauma. Um, I think Sophia and Joan and anybody who's been working in this project, um, you know, no matter if it's just been a couple weeks or if it's been many years, um, like some of us, a lot of times we do here, it's like we don't want this project to be something that happened like I-94 through Rondo. I mean, there are folks that have made parallels. We've, we've heard that here as part of our discussions um, at, at Community Advisory Committee. We hear that and we bring that, right? We own that baggage and we just need to recognize that. So we need to um, take a pause and just us being in the room can cause trauma, can be traumatic. Um, and then also just raises some trust issues. So we recognize that. The other piece about this is we recognize that the tools that we have today that maybe we're really, really proud of and we're really happy on some of the great work that they've done might just not work for tomorrow or might not just work for what the community is going to need when we really kind of get a little bit deeper into the blue line and really begin to understand how the project is, is going to uh, serve the community. So. Just want to share with you that we've done that as a team and, and kind of um, we're learning. We're going to continue to learn, but just wanted to share that, um, you know, here's some things that that um, we recognize within ourselves. We we'll also want to share, maybe if we could go to the next slide, our opportunity to express some commitment here. We don't want to be just the folks that kind of parachute in, do this project, and then kind of go away, and then everybody's like, what happened? And, you know, we want to see some commitment. We understand folks want to um, have that commitment. So we recognize the answers just don't lie within um, the two agencies that are here today in terms of the Met Council or, or Hennepin County, that everybody has a role um, in the work is going to address those short-term goals and short-term needs as well as the long-term goals and the long-term needs. So we're here, we wanna to commit to the sustainability of this effort. Um, we also wanna identify the resources to address these issues. We get it, we understand, and that goes back to that sustainability piece that we need to bring resources to the table. And in the past, we haven't done that. and We've barely even touched the, these topics. So we get that and that is something that we can commit to. And we will commit with you that the actions we uh, take are tangible and measurable. So it's, as Sophia said, not admiring the problem anymore, that we actually can see some benefits that folks can touch, feel, 
and know that they have their fingerprints on that as well and then also be me measured. So um, thank you for that indulgence. We just wanted to share those couple of points with you all and, and um, uh, we can understand where our starting point is with the community. So with that, I think I'll throw that back to Sophia. Thanks, Sam. So we're building the table, right? We, were, we want to build an anti-displacement work group that uh, can, can create these implementable recommendations. And so this slide kind of gets to our commitment of as we build this, what are we trying to, what are we getting to? And then the rest of it uh, will be kind of feedback that we, that we want from the group. So um, kind of to the main point of we, we want folks at the table that have expertise. We want to make sure that there's resources so it's not just talk. Uh, that it comes to delivering measurable outcomes. One of the key components of this is convening, uh, to have a, a convened and managed by a third party facilitator. So somebody with the capacity to really dive into it that is a trusted resource in the, in the community. Um, that, and that'll be a question that we have uh, for this group in a second. And because you know, if uh, Sophia is presenting or Dan's presenting that we're putting the head of our organization at the table, right? And we really want this to be a collaborative Outcome because while it is fundamental to the project, it also goes beyond the project. So with that, we do want to meet on a regular basis through the duration of the project. There might, and when we think about potential next steps and, and things, there might be things that we do right away, right? But there's also pieces that might be addressed at different phases or even after the project is implemented. Yeah, Sophia, I mean, that's a good point. I, I just want to add, this is not short-term work. This is not you know, let's put an anti-displacement team together to help us um, pick the best root option for the for this. Um, this work will transcend any of the roots. This work will transcend um, the design, the implementation, the construction of, and the um, and the uh, you know eventual layout of the of the project. So, and then also it'll it'll kind of go into Hey, what happens now? LRT has been built. Has the community turned into and uh, evolved or stayed any of those pieces as as it is, we've wanted it to, and as the community has wanted to evolve with it? So, kind of also to our commitments, and thank thank you for that, Dan. Uh, having it tied and brought, as like Sam kind of said, have it having these conversations uh, brought to the advisory committees. Um, sorry, I almost need to sneeze. Okay, don't need to sneeze. Uh, in, in working on to develop that work plan so that this is you know, a very transparent group that has has goals that we that were that were wrapped into and furthering uh, throughout all the steps. So with that, time for some discussion and, and kind of like I said before, you know, you, you might need to think about some of this and you know, the, we might need to have more things to react to, but we really are hoping to begin the conversation and, and begin those, get, uh, getting those uh, brain wheels cogs going. Um, so part of this work is really coming to a shared understanding. When we, when we think about addressing really complex problems that are multifaceted, having a baseline understanding. So when I say anti-displacement or displacement or gentrification, I mean the same thing that that uh, you do, right? Because it, it, they are they can be big, complicated definitions with many facets, right? Uh, so coming to a definition, uh, kind of it's how it how would you define for your communities displacement, gentrification, other needed community benefits, or if you have any ideas on other fundamental uh, pieces of this work that we should be defining. If you don't mind. Yeah, um, this is Brett Buckner, um, Northside um, resident and from coming from uh, Met Council. First of all, thank you for actually taking this route um, uh, for this work. It's it's a step in the courageous lane. So we talk about things such as Rondo. We have to think about things such as Olson. Olson was just as impactful to our community as much as Rondo was. So we've experienced these these traumas in the past in the name of progress. 
Um, so thanks again from that standpoint. I would love to be able to add um, the conversation around equity, really deepen our collective understanding of that. Some people would have one definition in doing the work. Some people will have another definition. So we need to really establish that if that's going to be our lead piece from there. Um, coming from North Minneapolis, I'm gonna echo a lot of what um, Kenya said a couple weeks ago. Um, this is an opportunity because remember, the former route 1.0 went around North Minneapolis, you know, as opposed to um, actually coming and connecting the community. We affectionately sometimes call North Minneapolis the donut hole because everything happens around it. The opportunity that we do have, and this is again where I want to really amplify what Kenya said, because a lot of us in the community will say this as well. This is an opportunity to really create some brand opportunities for everybody. And we shouldn't be afraid of new things. We can't be afraid of the, the opportunity to raise the standards for everybody. Yes, there's gonna be some furniture that's gonna be moved, buildings that will be uh, adjusted. Um, but I think the biggest thing with trust through this whole process and starting to talk about how these words really are going to affect people. The piece about the trust is going to be the consistency and the clarity and understanding that everybody, you know, everybody's not going to be at the table and somebody's still going to have something to say about this whole process. But if we're consistent and clear on, on with our messaging, I think we're going to be in great shape. But, you know, what I am excited about this one piece is we are going to, we, we have to show the community that we are going to be a better community at the end of this process and that they have the ability to be a part of that development as well. And I think if we are very strong and, uh, and clear and deliberate about the idea of here's the opportunity, y'all. What do you, what do you want to, what do you want to lean in? That's when people are going to step up and say, well, I can do this. I can do that, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, again, I'll, I'll have, you know, I'm looking forward to the conversation more than anything else, but I wanted to make sure that one, we definitely amplify equity into that conversation, you know, that's a clear de definition amongst us and the overall piece. Um, but two, let's not be afraid of the moment and the opportunity at this point. Awesome comments. Thank you for Thanks. that. Thanks, Brett. Thank yeah. you. I believe Adam has his hand up. Thanks, Sophia. And Brett, spot on, spot on, sir. I'm also a Northside resident, so spot on with you. Um, I come from the construction side of things. So when I think uh, gentrification and when I think uh, uh, creating actual equity for people in the community, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, a decent job, you know? And is there any commitment? I know this is a little early in the project planning. How much commitment is there on this project to making sure that the not only the beginning the construction jobs and the well-paying union construction jobs most likely are people from the neighborhoods directly affected by this and then the later jobs the people actually manning the trains doing the maintenance doing all that kind of stuff service are also people from the community that we're directly trying to serve because that number one thing was jobs 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 of what people want to see, this is gonna create jobs in the neighborhood by infrastructure increases and all the businesses coming in. But are we gonna make sure that the people who live in the neighborhood are building their own community while we're doing it? Because I think that's pivotal in making sure that, yeah, they, they would only work on the LRT for say a two year project span, but that's a career change. And when you wanna talk multi-generational impacts, your parents, or your siblings or your community makes a good impact and a good community job that just leads to another generation and the, the more the trades especially the more you have a person connected to a trade the faster and easier it is for you coming up to get into that trade or even have it as a viable option so i i know that's early in the ideas but that's a very big avenue i think that needs to be completely flushed out in my opinion 
Adam, that was a question that I got asked basically earlier earlier today, and I know Dan wants to respond, but also um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll kick us off a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, to start out with, and the Met Council has uh, programs uh, that focus on getting people in the construction trades as we think of launching these major um, light rail projects. And you know, it, to, to your point, right? This project will be under construction for you know, like three th three years or something, number two or three something somewhere number of years, um, and that that is a great job opportunity, uh, but it also isn't a forever, you know, it's not forever, right? So we need to expose people to the various trades that come with these major construction projects, and then get them tied to big companies that do this work so that they can apprentice in, they can maybe work on these projects and then they can develop their career uh, post them happening. And we, uh, Metro Transit has D-Line that's starting construction. Uh, you know, that was a kind of question about what, how, you know, we're, we're starting in the sandbox, right? Uh, and, and then this will come on, you know, later after their construction is way done. Uh, but it, it kind of all ties together, right? As we, as we have this kind of like system of projects, um, uh, really kind of focusing focusing in on that and then um, and I think we can do better uh, even with this project and I'm, I'm sure Dan will add to that but in terms of our drivers and our uh, LRT operators and our mechanics and all, all of those other kind of pieces that make Metro Transit run uh, we're, Metro Transit is undergoing basically a pretty uh, it's an effort that can improve uh, but they're being really intentional uh, about uh, making our um, our systems more target targeting communities to get them into our system um, and then reducing barriers to entry like uh, you know getting having a CDL how that works how some of our testing works to be drivers um, all of that is is something that that as an agency we need to improve upon and keep chipping away at um, because they are they are good jobs right they're good um, uh, so uh, yes, I think some of those those uh, thoughts and ideas are started, and we really need to focus on that and amplify that as we get further into the work. Sorry, Dan. Well, no, that those are all that, those are all echoing comments I would make, as well as just that we also started a discussion with a a former on the line project partner. Um, when we were down Highway 55, but still very close, and that's Summit OIC, and how Summit OIC can help become a partner in building up the opportunity maybe for some apprenticeships, um, and then just how we can get, I mean, you can't do enough right now to try to get folks into the trades, and so to the extent that we can help build some of that up and actually get people from the community working in the community on improvements that are part of the community, um, that's just great. And so uh, we don't know all the answers, but we do know people to talk to and partner with to help us move that that issue along. And if I could just add a, um, to what Sophia and Dan shared today, there's already folks that are asking those questions that Sophia and Dan say, that are working on Southwest, right? Like how how quickly can we get this project going so that there, is, there isn't that gap, right? Yeah. That, that uh, capacity that's been created on Southwest can move quickly over there. I would also say that um, Dan and I and a couple other staff this morning, we're talking about that and we're not waiting for construction. We're beginning to ask those questions now. What can we do during procurement for some additional services and really begin to expand that, right? Because that creation of wealth starts today and we shouldn't anticipate it happening in the future. So if we're not intentional today, it makes tomorrow less likely. So um, I appreciate that comment, Adam. Thank you for that. I'd like to respond to Brett, if I could. Uh, I'm Pion Blackfoot Indian. And a lot of people don't know this, but in New York, there was a tribe of New York that became steel workers because no one else wanted to do the work. And they built they built uh, wealth by the trades. And I would love to see North Minneapolis build wealth through the trades and vitalize the community. Agreed, Jim. Yeah, yeah I, I would say to that as all, along with the trade it is the investment opportunities as well as we know what is happening on green line and many other places the multiple uh um 
uh, re uh, real estate investments and those kind of opportunities that normally get passed by because ownership is in other people's hands as we're trying to develop these um, cultural corridors along um, West Broadway and other places as well. Can, can I uh, kind of echoing what Brett said earlier and, and what we're talking about in terms of the possibility of displacement and gentrification and the risks behind that. Can Is there a way to discuss what happened on the green line on university, what the fears were, what was actually realized and some of the lessons learned on that project? And, and with those lessons learned, just kind of reach out to the community and, and have the discussions centered around, here's what happened, here's what we thought would happen, here's how we're gonna do better for this project moving forward. Because I think we have experience and we have a case study. And we have a case study that is not so old that the data is irrelevant and it's still, the data is still coming in. So I, I'd like to just ask the people that are experienced with the previous projects, if they can bring that to the table and, and be open and honest with what worked and what didn't. Because that's, that's going to go back to Brett's point about building trust in the community and making sure that people, you know, we're talking about jobs that are going to come and go, but we also need to talk about the temporary displacement as well as the long-term displacement risks, as well as the opportunities after the construction project. Just yeah, so if I could, oh, sorry, Sophia, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say uh, yes, and also kind of pulling in uh, national examples of people that are are doing similar work and kind of updating that conversation as well. So you know, we, we've tracked a lot of business and business change uh, during Central Corridor that I think we can really bring forth uh, to this discussion. Uh, and then there's people that have also kind of uh, uh, pushed some of these discussions other, way, uh, other, uh, other places. Um, so kind of building that knowledge up in the uh, in our advisory committees and the conversations we have with communities uh, is I think uh, we, we've heard we've been hearing that as well so when we think of next steps uh, something that we will need to do yeah. Sam uh, sorry. Yeah, thanks. no 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 you're fine I was just going to add uh, Dan Soler is very close to that right given his experience and so Dan can bring that in um, and appreciate that, Giuseppe. That's exactly what we were thinking too. That 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 was a model. That was a opportunity, an experience. And there's you know kind of unique things that sort of factored into that. And how could we use that to really broaden and create some best practice experience and bring that to the Blue Line extension? I'll just also say that um, the council has benefited from that in the sense that that has created opportunities and capacity. And um, we have a council member, Chris Ferguson, who you know was definitely impacted as a, as a property business owner on Central Corridor and would love to have him come because he'll see, he sees so many sides of that. And I appreciate your comment, Giuseppe, of like, we should get real, the experience is what it was and bring those voices and not be afraid to that because what that is uh, going to allow us to do is be better and not run from that. And, and, and for sure, be humble and say, yeah, this was a mistake, but we recognize it and we're learning from it. That part is going to be really important in a community that is afraid to trust again. Yeah, I mean, Giuseppe, we we got that. So your comment was also, I think, Sam, almost identically um, came to us at the Business Advisory Committee as well. Hey, let's pull together some data, some facts, some some numbers, some ex real world experiences about what works and what do what doesn't work. And I mean, we've got experience of what did it mean? What did it mean because of parking? What did it mean because of construction? Where have we seen? I mean, we we can point to real examples of of where. Um, we saw development succeed and where, we, where we've seen development, you know, maybe not take off where we thought maybe that it would. And so why is that and what are the differences there? So that's all part of how we can bring that information to this. Yes. Oh. And Giuseppe, what I love about that question too is it also challenges us in the way that we can talk about development, but who's development and who benefited? And that's, I think, is the real piece of that, that, that question and bringing that forward. Yeah. Uh, Ken has been waiting for a little bit with his hand up, so want to give the floor to Ken. Sure, and and I I absolutely appreciate the rich dialogue that's been happening. 
I, I want to add one more concept to this concept of real life experience, what we learned and, and uh, the lessons we learned that were not good that we want to change. Um, we have also an opportunity not just to collect organizations within the area that that we need to focus on, but we have a wide reach of agencies to reach out to as resources. And I think we also need to be able in those conversations with citizens, whether they're about development, whether they're about uh, housing, whatever it is, uh, increasing wealth, uh, looking for jobs, I think we need to partner and bring in or at least have a resource specialist that can connect people with the resources that they may need that are out of our scope. Um, but we are going to encounter them nonetheless, and um, we should be able to have at our easy disposal a way to connect them to the resources that they may need in order to uh, move to the next step. Um, I, I think, we, you know, I think the conversations I've heard, um, you, you know, DEED has a lot of outreach programs that they want to try to focus on apprenticeships and internships and, um, and the Department of Transportation is always looking for CDLs. Uh, so I think there are lots of partners that we can bring in as exterior kind of partners with us to be able to hand off uh, resources to people that may need it in order to, for them to move to the next phase. Good point, Ken. Uh, and and uh, that'll actually lead into our next question of, um, uh, I know uh, Gene has his hand up, but since Ken teed us off, I'll just move to the next slide. Uh, anyway, so that this can get added to the conversation, I'll turn it to Gene with his hand off. So, when we think of setting this table of this group to uh, talk about anti-displacement work uh, and kind of those um, the pieces the pieces that were that Ken was talking about, um, we have three kind of main questions, which is who in community would be a trusted facilitator to convene and manage? And uh, as we've been framing this, it's both um, and it, it could be an individual, could be an organization, or, or organization with uh, an individual within an organization. So right, like you could say. Um, Kira, and then I have a very specific person at Kira, or um, I know this individual that's a consultant that has been doing this kind of work um, that would that uh, we, I've worked with uh, on maybe a, a similar project that we would like you to consider. So uh, that, and then kind of the in your communities, the phil philanthropic non nonprofit community organization community organizations, uh, others in the development community that you could that. Um, to kind of how Peggy Sue phrased it in the chat uh, that are ready and would really like to partner on pushing pushing this forward. Um, and to what Ken brought up, based the other public agencies that are that can really add to this discussion and, and connect uh, those those pieces. Um, so since we kind of teed that up, uh, uh, there is some there's some thoughts to continue the discussion with, and we'll turn it to Gene to add his thoughts. Well, actually, I'm trying to turn off my little hand icon, oh. but I can't figure out how to do it. <laughs> uh, you, if, you awesome. hover, if you hover by your name, it'll give like an X and you just click it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you can raise your hand. Uh, so for folks, uh, uh, feel free to continue to use the chat, the raise hand function. Um, if you hover by your name in the participant list, you can turn it on. It's also the on the, and now I can't see it because I'm in presenter mode, but there's a bar on the bottom. There's like a couple dots uh, and a raise hand is one of one of those functions. Does anybody have any thoughts on these on these questions? Wow. That's a hefty question there, Sophia, but yes. Um, <laughs> um, so I'll start. Yeah, bottom up, for sure, I'm looking at it from our standpoint in North Minneapolis, definitely affected our public school system, of course. I'm not sure if you had a chance to, I mean, I'm pretty sure you had, but the, and for two reasons. One, of course, headquarters is right there, and 
would be a, a amazing partner but two because of the potential that we're going to have to really think about of district parking and they have one of the largest parking lots in the area to bring them into this conversation is i know that it's been done but i'd rather say it out loud as opposed to not saying it from there um i'm i'm i rely upon two facilitators um and again this is a group you rock, of course, um, with uh, Makeda Zulu Gillespie and her team over there would be a great advocate, great team, and also um, Anika Robbins, who knows the area in the air in our community as well. I would actually add in as, um, and again, we have some emerging groups, uh, philanthropic. We have the Phillips um, Foundation that's coming onto West Broadway now, which is a brand new development. Um, definitely Sanctuary um, Church is someone that you would want to uh, connect with as well. Uh, and I'm missing one other, of course, the park board is, has a seat at the table already, um, but because of projects that we're working on along West Broadway and adjacent to it, uh, it's something to be held as well. So that's my initial list. I probably have a couple more later on. Yes, and uh, to that, if you think of others uh, that you want us to include in the notes or amend uh, to kind of the discussion and for us to keep track of, feel free to uh, email me later. There, you know, you kind of you kind of start to ruminate, and you're like, um, like when I even started to ask myself this question, I was like, oh, I, you know, I, you know, people start popping up, right? As, as so, uh, just encourage the committee to do that as well. Um, if you send me suggestions post this meeting, we'll attach them. Well, one, we'll, we're bringing it in anyways, but we'll attach it to the meeting meeting minutes. I mean, this this team this team guys is something, you know, a little bit different than we've done before. Um, we want to try to bring together the kind of disciplines that can help advance this discussion, and we don't want it to be all public members. Um, we need some help from the de development community. We probably need some help maybe from financial um, organizations, um, like we said, nonprofits. And then we really want this team, this this working group, to be able to develop, um, you know, recommendations that are that are implementable that we can bring to the appropriate jurisdictions, which may be a city in some cases, maybe the county or Met Council in other cases, to help put in place policies, practices, procedures um, that can advance this agenda. And that some of those groups actually might be the implementers or right. uh, uh, of or part or all of some of the some of the recommendations. And also just want to say, even as we form this table, uh, we we would you know, also consider a, a robust plan of broader community outreach. You know, like step one and two, uh, trying to get it all together. Kind of let it ruminate for a second. Minnesotans don't like sitting in silence, but uh, I'll let it for a second and then we'll kind of get on to the next slide. Well, I will say, uh, Sophia, one of the things that I'm thinking about is just in Robbinsdale, I know we have uh, a human rights commission and I would I would think that in other communities across the, the corridor and alignment um, that, you know, that they would have human rights commissions as well that are just engaged in equity and, um, and justice and, you know, talking about displacement and, and gentrification that m might be able to help facilitate some of those ideas as well. I know I Golden Valley has would, one. I know the city of Minneapolis obviously uh, pulls that in. I mean, Hennepin County has a whole business line of disparity reduction that touches on numerous things, including transportation as well as housing and and uh, many things. So that that's a good suggestion, Jason. Each of the, I mean, there's just there's just this is this is where we need to be um, in 2021 as we evaluate and move forward this this piece. Uh, also add, you know, the um, Met Council also has an equity advisory committee. Um, you know, maybe it, maybe they don't come to every meeting, but we're bringing uh, some of this to them for their feedback as well as we're uh, developing some of this. So it's layering all these pieces. 
uh, seen some comments in chat uh, from, just want to read it out loud for folks. Uh, just uh, uh, Peggy Sue suggests that more grassroots orgs like neighborhoods or uh, uh, gave the example of our streets. No, sorry, Sophia. Neighbors for More Neighbors is a is an organization. Yes, I was stumbling over my my words a little bit. Yeah. So those, those, yes, are, those are ones I have not heard of before. So that's good to see. Yeah. So Neighbors for More Neighbors, and we're starting to do this in Ward Four. I think I'm going to be the contact person where we're going to talk about housing in the ward and talking, especially around like the council races, because neighbors. Or more neighbors, I think is they're doing like a housing survey that all candidates kind of filled out to kind of get a sense of where they fall in lines in terms of housing. Um, but they do a lot of kind of advocacy around um, kind of like there's a lot of anti 2040 rhetoric. So they're kind of the opposite of that, of really saying that Minneapolis needs to be a place that's building more housing and being really inclusive. Um, so I have some contacts there if that's something that we would want to connect with. But then also, yeah, our streets is doing a lot of organization organizing along right now, Lindell and Lowry, um, Lindell Avenue South and then Lowry Avenue Northeast. But um, I think they're a great organization that's really focused on making streets better for those who bike and walk. Um, and I think transit obviously fits into that. So I would say there's a lot of people, especially kind of that opposite rate of a lot of people who live in these neighborhoods who are really excited about this and advocates for it exist within those groups. Thank you for those suggestions. I think that, that that's what we're that's what we're looking at, really looking for feedback from. Okay. I'll so if I can make a suggestion, Sophia, kind of like what we did with this one, I think maybe this is a good place to like go back and think and in our next meeting come back with i mean obviously we can always communicate with one another and and share this the, the information if we have ideas but to like come back and begin our next conversation with talking about what we uncovered and what ideas we came up with uh thank you for teeing that up jason i think that makes it um i have a few more questions but maybe that since you teed it up i'm going to go to the last slide and then we'll go back uh, which is, uh, we want to bring this topic back in May uh, for for the committee and uh, to kind of start forming up these ideas uh, and talking more about how we get to this implementation. And so kind of that uh, next up reaction, so building upon what we're talking tonight, um, and then also kind of add to it by starting to develop our approach to form and support this working group. Uh, and some of the initial framework for the group. There's some very fundamental questions uh, that you know we get pushed on as we start to think about these things, and so kind of pushing that step forward um, and you know putting some ideas to paper a little bit, um, but then still having a lot of room to uh, adjust and form and react and add um, and and shape it so that it's right. Um, so so with that, just also want to start everybody's brain cogs. Uh, going on uh, these questions. So major, uh, or not necessarily major, but just important initial actions for this group to take and consider. And then thinking about how we define success. So, you know, to the kind of the comment about cr uh, courageous conversations, if we uh, not, uh, when we look back, have we been successful? What does that look like? Uh, how how could we just start to define that? Other fundamental questions that we want to start framing as we think of bringing this group together. And I think these in particular, once the group is formed, they'll be something that they'll need to talk about a lot. You know, so uh, uh, but there's there's pieces of, there's pieces of this that we want to kind of pull into the framework and the fabric uh, as we start to think of starting to get this started because it'll help us you know set that table. So. Last big and uh, lofty question for thoughts. So I'll start this one out or just to kind of refer back to if anybody missed it in the chat, but Scott had made the suggestion of like, can we get a summary of available data and studies that I think like set the groundwork and kind of level set what we know now? And I think that will help us determine 
what is successful because again kind of looking back at those previous experiences what did we think was going to happen what actually happened which pieces of those were benefits and which ones were you know were were negative so i think just the more information we can have that's like the data to say here's where we level set this is like the the grounding of where we start i think is a good that's a good point and just it didn't come up before, so maybe start there. Yeah, I think that is a that is a piece, and then we've heard it, um, I think, multiple times now. Is uh, you know, as we think of diving into this conversation, you know, some of this some of this will be brand new, right? We actually want to chart uh, new, new uncharted areas potentially uh, and develop things that it um, you know that we we want to, that are tries, right? To to, to um, but we, we can learn from what's been done both locally and nationally and uh, getting our team to to put some effort into pulling that together and showcasing that to, to get into that conversation more deeply. And Dan, this, I think, this, wanted to respond to that. And then I well, see um, Brett and then Jean wanting to add. Well, let me just add before we hear from those guys, um, Sophia, that this, this what does success look like becomes a very, very subjective piece, depending on what people may say. In other words, some folks may say success to the community after building LRT is that property values increase by 25% on all properties within a half a mile. And some people's success may be that property values do not significantly change close to the LRT line in order to keep the area, area affordable. Two very different views um, uh, that are there. Some may say we want Part of building LRT is that we get more housing, but then, but what kind of housing, right? We get more housing, but we get more housing that is unaffordable by people that already live in the neighborhood. Is that success? Not necessarily, right? So more housing might be a success, but what about the right kind or wrong kind of housing? Um, what about the kind of businesses that people want to see? So all, all of that is different. And we saw some of that play out along University mm -hmm. Avenue when we built this, when we built LRT there. So, so this is going to, this is a, not a, there's a right answer thing. It's going to be different for different folks. And, uh, and what we want to make sure of is that, you know, that we are understanding just where those, where this leads us. I think some people had some questions, Sophia. I think uh, Brett was up next. Yeah, Dan, well, well said on that. Again, it's all based on perspective and even the timing of that perspective. So it's going to be fluid as, as much as possible. What, what, you know, again, I, I want to take a step back and I want to be able to take a look at those initial surveys, you know, uh, for this group as well. Because the, the, the story is being told right now by the people who are doing those surveys. They're telling us exactly what survey, what success looks like or what they would like sure. to look at or the concerns. So um, definitely, if we can really synthesize that, I think that would be a great starting point for all of us and continue to build, you know, just as we're trying to triple those numbers. I think that's going to really set the tone for uh, this narrative and the story itself. Uh, that I love that framing because, you know, as we look at past examples and even things that are currently happening around the country, like, so you could take the Grand Central Corridor, you know, Central Corridor, for example, and say, uh, we did really awesome uh, with this, right? It was an awesome program. And that doesn't really, why are we saying that? What what would be behind that, right? Like, what was the impact um, of uh, tangibly and how does that apply to what we're uh, trying to put right because that that's the um so no it's right it's it, it, it's how we're, we're looking at that data and bringing that into the the conversation of, of what do we want success to be did it do what we what we think success is now agreed Jean. well i think dan and brett are like spot on um i'm a little more simplistic about this what I'd like to see this happen in 10 years is that it's being used, usage, okay? In order to be used, I believe we need community wealth. And Dan is spot on because every community has a different interpretation or definition of what quote unquote community wealth is, whether it's 
this, that, or the other really doesn't matter to me as long as through this whole process and all these communities, each community can can experience their version of community wealth. But I believe in 10 years, the bottom line is usage. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. If people aren't going to use this, you know, it's meaningless. And the only way they're going to use this, I believe, is with community development, community wealth, however each community chooses to define, define that. So my word would be usage. When I, when and, I, I would, and I would want people to be able to say, instead of people saying, why would I consider building a business in North Minneapolis? Are you, are you crazy? That's a crime ridden nightmare up there. And instead of saying that, people would say, hey, guess what? I'm thinking about opening a business in North Minneapolis because we have LRT service close by. There's some exciting things going on up there. Um, there's a connection to Robbinsdale. There's some exciting things going on in Robbinsdale. I have the ability to get to, I can get on LRT from my North Minneapolis neighborhood to go to North Hennepin Community College to the north, to the airport or the Mall of America to the south, and I'm connected to the Twin Cities. And so I want to be here because it puts me um, connected. I, I had some people say um, that where we were talking about um, building north, they said, technically with, a, with an LRT station here, I can walk out of my door and have access to anywhere on this planet because all I have to do is ride the LRT to the airport, get on an airplane, and then I'm moving all over. And so why can't why can't the communities along this alignment realize the benefits that come with potentially having that um, very close by? That's that's part of what success can be. And so I think I think you know, I, I think you're you're saying that you're saying that right. I uh, also just want to just uh, kind of say that um, when we when we think of our communities, even without the benefit of LRT, um, there is vibrancy and goals and um, people living in them doing really great work. And so don't want to uh, take to lose that as well. Sophia, I was just going to say it looks like Scott has his hand up. Oh, um, Sophia, I just wanted to add on to, to Brad's comments. And uh, Jason, thanks for talking about the data. I think the question that I had last time we got together around kind of the use of this data, I, I very much see it as a package. And the question that I have for this committee, because I, I think it is a little bit of a Pandora's box once we start to open that up, what are we willing to do around that? And are we willing to engage with it? And I think Brett brought up some great points around when you start to bring up surveys that were done and lived experience and all those type of things, all that is seen through the filters of the folks that did the surveys, their motivations, what the questions were, all those types of things. And so I think we would be remiss if we just kept all that closed and had great community engagement, tens of thousands of inputs, but we never opened up the box. And so I'm, I'm suggesting that we open up the box we talk about the filters, we talk about the motivations, we talk about the survey quality, all those types of things during the course of this year that we have ahead of us. But I know that that's a big piece of work and I know that it'll probably lead to passionate discussions and things like that. But I would love for that to be in our scope. And the question I raised last time we got together is, and maybe I wasn't very articulate uh, on that is, is that in our scope? And I would love it to be, and I would love other uh, people on the committee to support that. I'll, I think I'll, uh, since you you phrased that to the committee, I'll uh, not, uh, yeah, let uh, let folks react to that a little bit versus answering my myself. Um, but I, uh, how we show data, how we think about data, um, how how we keep the conversation broad uh, to really get to those definitions are all things that we need to do. Lean lean into it. Uh, Philippe was uh, gave some comments in chat about uh, usage and what what people know how to do on transit. Um, 
other other comments or thoughts that people want to kind of get out? We're, uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, we don't have any other content to cover um, in terms of the presentation. Uh, it's really that our next meeting is in May and the project website. So can leave this time for kind of anything that came up during the agenda, um, even if it was uh, through this conversation also related to the first meeting, kind of leave this uh, um, time to how the, how the committee and the co-chairs would like to use the last 10 minutes. Well, Sophia, I actually have a question. I, I have a question. I have a question for Scott because I want to make sure. I, maybe I maybe I'm just. I, I want to make sure I'm understanding a little bit more about what you're asking, so that I can understand, or so that I can, you know, hopefully be able to deliver um, on that piece. So tell me. Just, just break that down a little bit more, um, and maybe other people understand it better. And I'm just missing this, but uh, so that, so like, where, what pieces should that you're thinking we need to get after or get available so that we can drill down on this further? Yeah, Dan, it's more likely that I'm just not being very articulate uh, late in the day today. Um, uh, so, so when I think about this again, as as we're asking for community input, uh, we're having community meetings, we're having a working group that we're spinning up. Um, the the experiences that folks bring to the table, all those things are extremely important, extremely valid. But we have real world experience from many many years of the Met Council around what worked, what didn't work. Um, this particular line affected residents in this way based on our best available knowledge. But after X number of months, here was the potential upside. And oh, by the way, here's some comments from them after the fact. Okay. And so, you know, we thought it was a net plus. That's what I'm asking to bring into this process. And again, if I'm trying to force something that doesn't make sense for this committee, you know, just shoot me down on that and, and others can shoot me down as well. But I think that should be part of our scope so that as we're talking about all the inputs and thousands of comments and everything else, we have a grounding in this. And the point I just tried to make a minute ago is I'm, I'm aware that that is fraught with difficulty because as soon as you open up the Pandora's box, everyone will have different impressions of, well, the survey was flawed or look who asked sure. this question yeah. or all those type of things. But I would prefer that we do that. I, I think that's more kind of higher value stuff for this group as the months go on. Not that everything that we're already talking about isn't high value, but uh, I would love for this group to engage on that. So, Sam, I think that I mean, I think that we can take that and and develop what you know to the best of our abilities, whatever we can to get around that. I don't think we should necessarily try to shy away from anything that can provide input, um, good or bad, um, to help guide our decision making. Yeah. Yep. No, I appreciate it. Thank, thanks for providing some clarification on that, that, Scott. And there are definitely things we can bring forward. Um, I would like to think that the um, Center for Transportation Studies is maybe sort of a, a neutral uh, organization in our community. They have done some good research on the existing blue line and on the existing green line. We can bring that in. And, you know, and as the group feels comfortable calling that foundational documents to help us begin to frame some of these issues, we're, we'd be happy to do that. But yeah, we can uh, we can start thinking about how we share some of that information too. Well, so has Humphrey too. I know Humphrey Institute yeah. has done some things around valuations, things like that. So there's a lot, of, there's stuff out there we have to, some of it we have to search for, but that's okay. We'll, we'll see what we can get our hands on to uh, help inform and help uh, move along the discussion. So this is Ken. I've got a little bit different of a question, a uh, different kind of a question. Um, so I know we're still at this really high level um, perspective that we are kind of beginning at. Um, the other question I want to ask is, are there components of uh, the Met Council that are already designing uh, footprints for stations, depending on what the stations look like, the options of the stations? 
um, design of the cars. Are, are those things happening simultaneously? Do they happen later on? Is there a process for that? At both. So some, we, we will continue to advance um, our engineering as we're having some of these conversations. So kind of parallel, parallel tracks that we have to work on if we, uh, um, so kind of, we kind of think of the four boxes, right? That there's the evaluation. So kind of our kind of planning lens of, of the project. There's the advancement of our engineering. Um, there's the, and then there's this discussion, um, kind of the, in, in our uh, past project commitments. Some of the specific examples that you brought up, such as like procurement of LRT vehicles and what they would look like and uh, look like inside, um, or um, anything beyond just like the basic station footprint. So like, this is how much space we need for a station um, is gonna happen later in the process. So like what we'll talk about this year when we start to play stations uh, is really some of the really basics. Like it takes about this wide uh, and this is maybe kind of how you, connect to it, but that uh, built, beefing up that station design um, will kind of be a, 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 a process. You know, uh, when we think of actually like laying out the specifics of the platform, um, you know, we, we, ha we kind of had some blue line station design that we can lean on uh, and bringing that forward and getting into it. Um, we're going to end this year with very, very conceptual engineering, basically that, that baseline to answer some of the questions. So um, sum that up, uh, both uh, so advancing it, but not necessarily to the to the to uh, the level that we're uh, and Sophia, of the on, examples. on some parts of the corridor, we're very far along with the design. So this yep. is kind of a funky one, Ken, in that um, you know it isn't a it isn't an alignment that we're starting from scratch on. So right, up right. in Brooklyn Park, we've got a lot of the design work done. And then in the southern area, a lot of it's changing, and so um, so there's a real there's a real um, hybrid of where we are in that. Okay, um, so and maybe what I can do is you can uh, connect me with who, whomever I might speak to, but I have some very specific safety issues related to the footprint um, that we have learned from Central Corridor. Uh, that still haven't been corrected and still exist as safety issues in my mind that I want to make sure I uh, get on the design table early so people can start thinking about that. Oh, yeah. We uh, yeah we, Nick. We'll find yeah. a way to make that happen because okay. I'm very interested in whatever you're saying, going to say, Ken, I'm interested in. <laughs> I know we've done a lot of, we've walked and looked at yeah. and and yep. touched and felt and and <laughs> you know uh, and done all kinds of things out there and so yeah let's make sure we i like to say we're going to build everything on this line just like central quarter except we're going to get rid of the things that don't work okay <laughs> everything else we're going to keep so um that's a little bit i mean that's a kind of a joke but at the same time you learn and you make adjustments and then you do better Absolutely. So we'll Absolutely. do some of that okay uh, all right and so can, so can um uh, let's let's touch base. I know Dan would be interested in the conversation. I know Sam would be, um, and uh, Nick hasn't done much talking today, but uh, uh, he'd be very much interested in the in the conversation. Okay, terrific. <laughs> As always, Ken, we will include you. We, we you've been helpful on on, on our previous design, and and uh, we'll, we want to keep that collaboration. All right. Thank you. Well, great great meeting today, guys. Um, Jason, well, Philippe, well, thank you. We, we'll let the, the co-chairs have the last words here. <laughs> hey, it's Felipe. I just want to say thanks for everyone for um, joining. There's really good discussions um, about it. So um, there's a lot of, lot of follow-up, but I think uh, getting together and the starting place of seeing what they did with the green line, I think is a really good starting point to help us really figure out uh, where to go from here. So. Thank you, Jason. Any last, any, any? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess out the meeting tonight. I'll just say, you know, I appreciate everybody taking the time and, and the uh, the thoughtful input, and I think, you know, just taking some time to think about some of these topics and then revisit in our in our next meeting next month will, I think, really help to further these conversations. It's kind of hard to like come up with all these ideas on the fly, right. so. 
uh, we'll have a month to think about it and hopefully we'll come back with some, some more amazing and, and thoughtful ideas. Awesome. Well, uh, have a good evening, everybody. Um, to the extent that we want to continue everybody. conversations, you know where to find me uh, and look forward to getting deeper into these discussions with you all.